Okay, so we are very honored to have with us our guest today, Max Abrams. He's the author of a new book called Rules for Rebels, The Science of Victory in Militant History, and it's published by Oxford University Press. Max is an assistant professor of political science at Northeastern University out in the Boston area, uh, and he's an expert specifically on terrorism and counterterrorism. He's been published in numerous places, appeared on numerous programs, television and radio. Um, we're going to be talking about two of the, uh, of the articles, or three of the articles of his that, that he's published, um, two that were in the Foreign Policy magazine and one that was in the uh, Los Angeles Times recently. Um, anyway, so welcome to the show, Max. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, happy to be here, guys. Uh, Thank great. you very much for being here. Yeah. So we want to start off, um, before we get to your book, Rules for Rebels, I think it'll help, it'll help sort of... Um, establish more quickly also sort of where we're coming from here to talk about a few of your articles. And and these articles were, were as I recall, because of the, the sort of the heated nature of um, discourse around Syria, the very heated nature. And if you stray at all from a particular Washington, London line, people go bonkers. Um, uh, yeah. And so, so we want to start off with... Um, with a few of your articles here. I mean, the first one, I don't know, John, which one you want to start off with? I mean, it's one that came out. So maybe this, the simplest would be five myths. Yeah, that was a, I remember this article came out and it's it's very important again to re, I mean, a lot of, you, you, you do a lot of debunking of myths, Max, which is great. I mean, this is something we like to do on, on uh, Radio Warner. And you, you published this article. Um, so this would be about a year and a half ago in March of 2017 uh, in Foreign Policy. And the headline is Five Myths About Syrian Refugees. You co-authored this piece. And yeah, yeah. Foreign, foreign Affairs, that piece. Foreign Affairs, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, foreign Affairs magazine. Uh, so, I, I mean, first talk about what the general myths are and then tell us how you went about what you guys found by exploring these sort of generally received ideas there. Well, so this was, I, I, uh, we won a pot of money Mm. And um, then uh, we had uh, researchers uh, in Syria. Uh, I think that they were uh, Syrians and they were from all over the country. Um, and so uh, we, uh, you know, they spoke to uh, uh, refugees uh, all along the, uh, uh, the, the, the migration route, mm. uh, so something like seven different countries into the EU. Uh, you know, Greece, Hungary, uh, Germany, Turkey, and they spent uh, months uh, interviewing, uh, you know, these uh, uh, migrants and refugees and uh, asking them all sorts of questions. And I think that this is a, a good way to do research. Uh, it, it's good to uh, have some kind of physical presence. Um, but at the same time, I've seen a number of people who have gone to Syria uh, and they're not Syrian and they go in one area. For example, they hang out only, you know, with the, with the opposition. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I could name names, but yeah. who cares? Um, <laughs> and so so they have, you know. We, they, we like naming names, but if you don't want to, that's right, fine. But yeah. I, but I mean, so, yeah. so, then, so then there's like this veneer as if they're really, you know, mixing right. in with, with the locals and that everything they say must be true. When in fact, it seems to me that most reporters don't go throughout all of the country and don't go uh, certainly to many different countries speaking to Syrians. Um, and also they may have sort of biases uh, upon arriving. And so if you use people that you don't know, a lot of different people asking questions, especially those who are local native Syrians uh, and they're traveling all over the place, that seems to me like a good approach to, to getting to the truth, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I should say that I wasn't the, uh, the, the, the mastermind behind this project. Uh, Dennis Sullivan was really uh, at the helm, uh, and I was kind of a, a later addition. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so he, he was more active in terms of winning the money, but I took the lead on uh, writing that article that you're describing. Mm -hmm. And I think that the most, I don't even remember all of the different myths uh, offhand, but 
The most important one is the first one. Yes. Uh, and that has to do with uh, the causes mm -hmm. um, of the of the of the refugee problem. Um, and, and then the conventional wisdom, of course, is that uh, the, the causal mechanism was very, very simple, that it was Assad, mm -hmm. uh, that Assad, you know, was so ruthless. And, uh, you know, it was basically the population against Assad and the population uh, had to flee Syria because uh, they opposed him. And uh, by extension, they must also support the rebels because the rebels are, for, are, are fighting Assad. Um, and so uh, it is true, I should say up front, that uh, when you ask the, um, you know, the people leaving Syria how they feel about Assad, um, they're, they're not, you know, big fans in general. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, many of them are uh, quick to list him um, as a cause uh, for their fleeing the country. However, when you ask again, when you ask, when you present them with multiple choices, um, to what extent do you blame uh, Assad? To what extent do you blame the rebels? To what extent do you blame both? To what extent do you blame neither? Uh, most people fleeing Syria blamed both. Mm. So there actually wasn't a lot of love at all uh, for for the rebels. And so that, that I mean, I, I think for people who really know Syria, that won't that wouldn't surprise them. Right. But for those yeah. who are just reading sort of, you know, the mainstream media, they have this very, very simple narrative um, that that, you know, that, that Syrians were leaving because of Assad, when in fact, um, the, the, the most common answer uh, was not that they were just leaving Assad, um, but that they were leaving uh, because of uh, both. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are important implications um, for this finding beyond just getting to the truth. Um, and what I think that, that their answers really highlight um, is that mainly Syrians want peace, mm -hmm. that they were fleeing not from one, you know, one international actor versus another. They were fleeing from danger. Right. And so the implication is that they would come back to Syria if they could, um, if the violence went down, even if Assad were still there. And so um, based on those uh, interviews, hundreds of interviews, I was able to uh, make that, um, you know, kind of reasoned, prediction that it seemed to me that people were leaving Syria not because of Assad but because of the violence and that if Assad were to stay and the violence were to go down I would expect a lot of people returning and uh, I believe that that's the case yeah that has been the case in fact one thing that I think you you've mentioned in social media that we also find is that the things that that we were saying three years ago that got us a lot of abuse are, are now suddenly the conventional wisdom like a lot of people are now saying oh we always knew that but that's not what they were saying then if you look carefully oh, sure. at what was being said then uh the siege of aleppo for example was uh the fall of aleppo and it was the end of everything and to my um probably naive shock uh, a month after the fall of aleppo uh the BBC was running stories on how businesses are coming back to Aleppo and everybody who was interviewed in East Aleppo used the same word hell to describe their time under the rule of the Sunni militias. And then there's this frightening amnesia uh, about what was being reported even a year ago. Yeah, I mean, um, people keep uh, changing uh, what it is that they were actually saying at the time. Yeah. I mean, so many claims about Syria have been revised, and uh, I think that pundits are very lucky um, that people don't, uh, you know, call them out and remember, you know, and remind people uh, how off uh, their core claims were. I mean, I could go over some of the, some of them. I mean, they said, for uh, for example, that they continuously overrated the strength of the rebels. Uh, relative to Assad. Everybody was predicting uh, that Assad uh, would fall. Um, and one of the reasons why they predicted this is because they also predicted that Russia would not um, really invest heavily 
uh, in Syria militarily as it would end up doing starting in 2015 because uh, people, remember, people would say things, you know, supposedly informed people would say things like, you know, oh, Russia remembers its experience in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't want to repeat that. It, it knows that it will get bogged down. Uh, the word further, quagmire occurred pretty mm-hmm. Yeah, another sort. quagmire. Furthermore, Russia doesn't have the, the economic, you know, power or the military capability. So if it were to go in, it, it would get bogged uh, down. Um, of course, you know, that didn't turn out to be true. Then, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, there's no way that Russia is going to even attack ISIS. So yeah. Russia is actually ISIS's air force, yes. right? Yes, Russia, that was Michael Russia, Weiss. I remember yeah, that uh, one, yeah. Russia like, Russia actually likes ISIS. Mm-hmm. Um, or, uh, or we're not going to make progress against uh, ISIS unless there's regime change because Assad supports ISIS. So we need to we need to remove him. Or, or the, the rebel composition, you know, they, they've been vetted. Um, they're actually uh, quite uh, moderate mm-hmm. um, and on and on and on. So th- there was just so much uh, nonsense about Syria. And I did try to use Twitter um, to uh, question some of these conventional wisdoms, which are, which turned out to be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then, of course, nobody's nobody is accountable for being wrong. They just move on to the next they, they become experts on the next story and they get wrong on that. I mean, that's that's one of the things that's very frustrating. But but yeah, um, I, yeah, go I, ahead. I'm sorry. I, I've thought a lot of I've thought a lot about this. Um, the you know, some people sometimes use the expression, uh, you know, falling up or failing, failing up. up. Yeah. Yeah. Failing up. You, you get it wrong, but you, you still get a promotion at the end of the day. <laughs> The, uh, I mean, the way it works in punditry is you don't get rewarded for being right, because often when you're right, uh, that means that you were a dissident. <laughs> you get yeah. you get rewarded for being uh, in a social network of yeah. other people, even if they also got it wrong, because then everybody's in this together. Yeah. You know, take, mm. take, take like the Iraq war. Uh, if you oppose the Iraq war, uh, you know, like um, like Hans Blix or something, or, yeah. or Scott Rader, you know, yeah. if you were kind of a, like a dissenting voice uh, in Washington D.C., you were you were ridiculed. Yep. Um, and even even those even the the vast majority of people who got the Iraq War wrong, they all got it wrong together, and so they they, they were seen as um, even even in retrospect as being reasonable, Mm -hmm. because based on the information, it was perfectly acceptable to get it wrong. So there really is uh, no justice in terms of, you know, getting things right and sort of winning over popularity due to your record. It's better just to uh, have the majority position. Yeah, it's depressing, but that that is is. how it is. Yeah. And it's and and it's true. I mean, being right early on is it gets you in trouble and you got to have some thick skin, um, you know, because they're going to come after you and and smear you this way or that way and, and and especially when we're talking about something as kind of emotionally charged as the Syrian war if you stray from the the sort of the you know the Washington London or uh, consensus on this you'll be labeled you could be labeled a sadist you could be labeled fascist all kinds of you know you're just with David Duke, like all these crazy things. So it's like, well, this is actually wrong and this is right. But that brings me to um, uh, the next article here we wanted to talk about. This is a, a more recent one. This was the first time I reached out to you and you said, well, let's wait till our, my book is out. So we've waited now and it's good. But anyway, the article was, is at the end of last year, you co-authored this. It was an it was a, um, editorial that you guys published in the Los Angeles Times. And the headline is, the pundits were wrong about Assad and Islamic State. As usual, they're not willing to admit it, um, and you know it's that's a beautiful headline. It's such a good headline. Yeah. I know, I love it, <laughs> and I, I love what you say here. Um, it's in the second pair. Uh, I mean, it starts off the Islamic State is a shadow of its former self. Uh, da, 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 but the rollback of Islamic State must come as a shock to the chorus of journalists and analysts who spent years insisting that such progress would never happen without toppling the regime of Bashar Assad, which is, of course, still standing. A cavalcade of opinion makers long averred that Islamic State would thrive in Syria so long as Assad ruled because the Syrian Arab army was part of the same disease. And then you name some of them. John Bolton, uh, you know, who's, who's now the, the, the Teddy Roosevelt mustache guy who's in yeah. Trump's cabinet, said uh, that defeating the Islamic State is... 
uh, neither feasible nor desirable if Assad remains in power. That's another weird line that, you know, Friedman and this Israeli think tank and, you know, these people are saying, well, we should keep Islamic State alive so long as it's killing. You know, they contradict each other a lot. So long as it's killing Russians and Iranians and Hezbollah and, and, and Assad's people, let's let's keep them warm. Um uh, you know, John McCain and Lindsey Graham are defeating Islamic State requires defeating Bashar al-Assad. Kenneth Pollack uh, prescribed a policy of building a new Syrian opposition army capable of defeating both Assad and the more militant Islamist Max Boot, who I think is is declared that he's wrong about everything and he's now going to be right. I think it's something. something yeah. Had some, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's a I, I didn't really. I didn't hear about that. I mean, I, I knew he was wrong about everything. <laughs> I didn't know it. That penetrated his thick skull that he was wrong about everything. Well, but beware of these things because, I yeah. mean, I've seen some other neocons do that and they don't really mean it. You know, it. the the, the, uh, <laughs> the thing is, is um, it is nice when people get things wrong for them to fess up to it, for yeah. them to acknowledge what their position was. Because it's and rare. And for them to <laughs> say that they got it wrong. But what's even more important is that we use history um, to inform our current and future policy recommendations. Ultimately, that's what really matters, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so so the real test isn't whether Max Boot says, you know, in 2003, whether he was right or wrong, but whether he's making the right calls now. Yeah. Um, right. And uh, I, uh, I'm i not persuaded, actually, that he is. Um, oh. So uh, so truth be told, you know, I, I'm not, I, I don't want to pretend that, you know, I've gotten... You know, they, you know, everything right. I, mm-hmm. I too have made my mistakes, but when I have, I really do try to learn. Um, and so uh, I, I got the Iraq war wrong. Um, I, I was pretty young. I, I worked at that time as a fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had just gotten my master's degree. So I was like the lowest level fellow there. (laughs) And everybody was telling me, not just in that think tank, but in all the think tanks, they're all very incestuous, as well as, frankly, you know, the White House, DOD, state, they were coming by all the time. And they were they were telling me, you know, at age 24, 25 years old, that going into Iraq was a great idea, that we'd be greeted as liberators, that Saddam was in cahoots with Al Qaeda, he's developing WMD. So who who am I really, you know, to to, to disagree? So I I said, okay, okay, you know, it, it's got to be uh, a good idea. You guys know um, what you're it, talking about, sort of it, thing. Yeah, right? I, I, I remember being told that uh, this or that 1980s uh, theorist yeah, was yes. a great line when I was doing my PhD. And I couldn't see it myself, but a lot of people for whom I had a great deal of respect were sure about that. And more to the point, they weren't going to sign off on my dissertation unless I did it. <laughs> so, there's this overwhelming career pressure as well as a kind of moral pressure because a lot of people, a lot of these people want to be your mentors and that slides into your friends at the same time. And the right. social pressure is tremendous. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, especially at a think tank, like maybe, maybe at the very top, you can, there can be a certain measure of dissent. But I mean, if you've been working there four months, yeah. then you probably don't want to, you know, Buck, yeah. the, uh, no. you know, the, the main argument of, of the think tank. And, but it wasn't just that think tank. It was real. You know, people look back at the Iraq war. They talk about Bush's war. But uh, mm-hmm. living in D.C. at that time, it, it really felt to me as if there was this tidal wave of, of agreement. There was. Um, yeah. but, but, but in any event, I, um, I realized very early on that uh, everything that I had been told uh, wasn't true. And so... Um, that really profoundly impacted me in terms of my skepticism mm. uh, about sort of the conventional wisdom uh, coming out of Washington, about the desirability uh, of uh, U.S. military intervention in the Muslim world, uh, particularly with respect to uh, regime change. And so here you have, I mean, I could be wrong, but I believe at least the last time I saw Max Boot, I, I think that he, uh, he might be saying the Iraq war was a bad idea. But he uh, aggressively supported uh, uh, intervention in Libya. Mm-hmm. He aggressively mm-hmm. supported, um, uh, you know, helping out the rebels. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's in favor of uh, of staying um, in uh, in Afghanistan. Yeah. So I'm not really sure how that learning uh, translates into uh, better policy advocacy. No, that makes sense, and it, maybe you're in a position to 
answer this probably naive question that I keep having, which is, I, I know that a lot of these think tanks have kept up the front and, and refused to change their minds. Did they, did they talk differently in private? Was there a sense, okay, maybe we are wrong about certain things, or, or was the consensus so strong that it survived the debacle in Iraq? That's a great question. I haven't heard that question ever. <laughs> um, I, 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 no, there wasn't any sort of private, um, you know, uh, skepticism. Uh, there was there was supreme confidence. The uh, what 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 people were belting out in the media. Uh, is truly what they believed. Mm -hmm. wow. and, mm -hmm. and, and I remember just, um, you know, when it, it was very obvious very early on that uh, what, what, you know, what these think tanks were saying wasn't true. I mean, it took a little while with respect to WMD, but in terms of the amount of resistance and, mm -hmm. and the growth of the insurgency, it was right. very obvious that we weren't wanted there. Right. And I, I, I distinctly remember you know, coming into the office, say, you know, you guys, like, what, what's the story? I don't think that, you know, that the U.S. is being greeted as liberators. And and then they, they said, well, you know, um, this was to be uh, expected. Oh, you know, God. you can't just go in. But 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 I, I actually wasn't expecting that because mm -hmm. that's not what I was told. And maybe I was too stupid at the time to just buy what I was told. But I did. I, I, uh, I was basically a consumer of, of the uh, consensus. And my and as a low level fellow, I then reflected it. Um, yeah, that's that's really interesting mm -hmm. to me. So I I always thought, well, maybe you know when they're talking over the proverbial water cooler that doesn't <laughs> exist anymore, um, <laughs> maybe it's different. But I, I guess not. I'm curious as the uh, as you were saying as as the war sort of turned on in Iraq, um, and it started becoming clear by that summer that the WMDs didn't exist and may have been we and we probably knew it all along and, and that the, the, you know, that the dossier was fudged and so on. And so like, were you, st I don't know how long you were in this think tank and this think tank world for, but did you see a change as it started to be, uh, become clear that the consensus got it, you know, kind of disastrously wrong? I mean, do they, do they stick, do they kind of reinforce the faithful line even more? Do they start saying, you know, do they start sort of cutting themselves off from saying, oh, this is Bush's thing, not our thing? Or like, how does how does that dynamic work? I wonder when you start realizing that. Yeah, I I, I didn't stay that long. Okay. I was there uh, for the for the build up to the invasion, the invasion. And then probably maybe six months after that, I was mm. there for about a year. Um, but uh, it it had a profound impact on, on my thinking about international politics and in the foreign policy making process, mm -hmm. uh, it seemed to me that uh, there were there were two main schools of thought that I was uh, exposed to. There was uh, basically what seemed like a Washington D.C. consensus of which I was a part, and then there was a uh, a vocal group of academics, uh, many of whom uh, are considered political realists. Mm. With a capital R, right. and they they expressed uh, skepticism about the Iraq War, mm -hmm. and um, you know I, I had just graduated from Oxford. I, I had a master's in international relations, and uh, I was thinking, you know, it was early career. Yeah. Uh, what was I going to do? Was I uh, going to go the academic route, or was I going to be, uh, you know, a think tanker for the rest of my life? And uh, I, I noticed at the time there was kind of this this bifurcation between the, the realists um, and the think tankers uh, over the Iraq war. And I uh, decided that I would allow the Iraq war to determine um, who really knows what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, after, after the Iraq war went south, um, I went and got my uh, PhD and I've been um, at universities ever since. Mm -hmm. And there are some real, you know, disadvantages to being at a university compared to in the think tank world. Uh, for one, uh, I certainly don't get paid as much as mm -hmm. I would as like a senior fellow at one of these big think tanks. Furthermore, there isn't nearly as much uh, media exposure. Right. Uh, Twitter has kind of bridged that gap a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, but, you know, these think tankers, 
they, they come out with like a, a monograph or yep. something. This yep. is like this is like an internal publication that they just kind of whipped out. That's not peer review. It's very often right. doesn't have data. It's kind of just like their musings. It's like an op ed, but maybe a little longer with like the brand of the think tank on the top. Yep. They like send it to the admin person who works right next to them. They post it online and then they you know advertise that they're going to give a talk and you have you know media networks all of them just showing right. up as if there's going to be some important piece of research <laughs> revealed uh so so they have like instantaneous you know mega media coverage mm -hmm. um whereas you know the us academics we're kind of, we, we don't have the media batting down the door you know it, it takes us oftentimes years uh to write these publications they have to we need to generate data we need to win the money for it to mm -hmm. to do the data collection um then we then you know we'll go the peer review route it could be under review for a year um you know th this book um rules for rebels the science of victory and militant history this is the product of 13 years of research wow <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. yeah so i mean uh, so there are some major disadvantages no doubt um mm -hmm about uh you know being a uh, a real academic i guess at a university but one of the advantages is i think that you're you're freer mm -hmm. you're freer mm -hmm. to say what you want um you know the uh the like the president of my university i don't think he knows what po what political positions i take and, and and i don't think that he cares mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and and even the people even my colleagues in my department i'm you know, good friends with them and we chat all the time, but they don't care what, you know, how I feel about Syria. I, I can switch my opinions around um, overnight. Mm, um, right. There's no institutional momentum for me to maintain my ideas. The, the mandate that I feel like I'm charged with is to get things right. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. it. I really just want to get things right. I don't, I don't have a constituency. I don't even really have, you know, I, I don't have an endowed position where I'm being funded to say uh, certain things. I really am very, very independent. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's um, the biggest benefit of being uh, at a university rather than at a think tank. Right. And what a shame then that that it makes it harder to, to uh, basically you're less accessible to media the more independent you are. I mean, the, another thing about think tanks is the, the, the ones that are successful, they have, they're very good at media. They yeah. groom you for media appearances. They'll train you how to, because you, you know, the, the different mediums, you're more effective as a speaker this way. And then, but you're better as a writer this way. You're better on radio this way. You're better on video this way. Uh, and then they also will have relationships with producers at um, radio and TV and, and the producers need think tankers. They need people that can come up with good short soundbite lines on things. And so, it also, yeah. yeah, definitely. I, I, I did benefit from getting the free media training. That okay, was cool. good. <laughs> it, was one of my, it was one of my first days there. Uh -huh. uh, they had like this, like they, they had spent thousands of dollars and it wasn't just for me. It was for all the fellows, but I had just arrived and I thought, wow, this is so cool, you know? Oh, um, this is great. I never heard this before. What <laughs> did they do? <laughs> oh, um, they, uh, you go on like a uh, on like a set. It, it looks exactly like um, you know as if you were being interviewed on you know CNN or, mm -hmm. or anywhere else. And they um, they uh, they gave uh, they gave us uh, like a uh, not a script but sort of background information on a topic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they asked us questions uh, and recorded it and showed us what we looked like answering mm. them. And, God, that's and, really and good also, and useful, I can tell you. Yeah. Wow. yeah. They also varied it up uh, in terms of the kinds of poses that we would be in. You know, <laughs> we, we, might be, we might be seated, we might be standing oh, okay. with microphone. Hand on chin, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, please, only look at my right side. <laughs> Yeah, I would, I'd have my hand up. What if you don't have a good side? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, David Petraeus has a side that he prefers. I was, told I, was, I, was uh, I did a, a Netflix documentary on uh, Syria, and uh, they, they came to me right after they came to him. 
And uh, they said to me, you know, what side do you prefer? <laughs> and I'm like, are you shitting me? You know, <laughs> you know, straight on is fine. Or, you know, I guess there aren't that many choices. But they said, no, we just came from a meeting with Petraeus. And he, he's real fussy about it. <laughs> wow. That's... Well, he wouldn't be the first vain general no, in American military history. I mean, Eisenhower famously said that he knows all about drama. He studied it for five years with MacArthur. So... <laughs> Yeah, the, he MacArthur was an early pioneer of the photo op, I suppose. So the, uh, this all really, in, I mean, it, this is important to know and interesting, as I, I think, is how it like kind of illuminates a sort of a world that seems we just see the people on TV or we see think tank, you know, and say this, but you're kind of helping humanize and 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 make it sort of more understandable, which is important. Mm-hmm. 